everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah. I'm the district manager, and we have a joint meeting tonight for land use and economic development committees. So we are going to do things slightly different. We need to take roll call for both committees at the moment, and then in the, later in the agenda, they will approve each committee's minutes. Um, so I'll start with the roll call for economic development. Nick Fazio. Here. Joy Campbell for the tears. Present. Constance Barnes Watson. Present. Abubakar Barry. Julia Gomez. Ashida Hillier. Yes. Yeah. Well met. Yeah. For our land use committee, uh, Chair Charles Modler. Here. Marty Walpuff. Here. Sylvia Alexander. Here. Bender. Here. Carol Blake. Here. Lee Chong. Here. Azio. Here. David Gelman. Present. Star Marie. Daniel Rowan. Here. Jessica Sosa. And Laura Spalter. Here. We have a quorum in. You do have quorum, yes. Mm -hmm. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Mm -hmm. And then for economic, you have five out of seven, so you do have Okay. Okay. So, um, you want to introduce the guests, or shall I? <laughs> Whatever you want to do. You go ahead. Whatever you want to do. Yeah, no, you go ahead. Uh, can we just make sure that the uh, Zoom attendees can can hear us? I can hear you just fine. We can hear. We can hear you. Everybody in the waiting room. And I'm going to make, um, Camilla, am I making sharing co-hosts with you for the presentation yeah. tonight? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Um, I guess for us tonight, we do have Camilla Thomas from DCT um, to make the presentation for City of Yes. Uh, I noticed we have one other person from DCP, Matt Waskowitz. I'm sure I'm not saying that right. I'm sorry. You were and close. We you were close. Okay. <laughs> from um, Assemblyman Dinowitz's office tonight, Jesse Lear. And we have our chair person, Julie Reyes, on the Zoom. And I think those are the guests we invited for the meeting tonight. Jessica Sosa is in the waiting room. Oh, oh great. Okay. Jessica's on Zoom. Do you want to start, Nick, with the approval of the Committee meeting minutes? Sure. Uh, minutes were distributed from October 3rd. Has everyone had an opportunity to read the minutes? Any discussion on the minutes? A motion to approve. Is there a second? Okay, any opposed? Any abstentions? Move. The minutes from October 3rd are approved. And then next, Chuck, you have the approval of the land use minutes. <clears throat> we have minutes for the meeting of October 18th. 18th of October, have you seen mm -hmm. any comments, a correction? I have one thing uh, we discussed it the other day. When we rejected the um, 232 and in, uh, independence um, uh, submission, uh, we mentioned there was mention of the uh, uh, lack of uh, adequate mitigation measures um, with respect to protection of the 48-inch caliper, oak tree, and canopy. But we also noted that the root structure should be right. included in that uh, discussion. So e even though we reject it, it's still an important feature for the future. So the change proposed would make that sentence read as follows. 
Whereas no adequate mitigation measures have been proposed with respect to the protection for the 48-inch caliper oak tree, the root structure addition, and canopy adjacent to the property. I'm sorry, sir. The root structure of the three words that would be added. I'm recording. I would move that. Is there a second? Be contrary minded. Action's done. Um, okay. So that brings us to our presentation from Department of City Planning. We have Camilla Thomas here tonight to give us a presentation on the city of yes for economic opportunity. Awesome. Thank you, Farah. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to speak with you um, at your board. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Camila Thomas. I'm the board liaison for DCP for the board. I'm joined today by Matt, um, who's very knowledgeable about the proposal today. Um, I'll be sharing my screen in a minute. Um, my presentation is about 50 minutes long, and I do ask you to please leave your, um, your questions and comments to the end so that we can um, just go through the presentation quickly and then get into discussion, which I'm sure all of you will have many questions for. Um, so, Farah, so I'm allowed to share my screen now? Okay, great. One second. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yes? Awesome. Okay. Um, so thank you guys again. My name is Camila Thomas. Um, and we're here joined by Matt to speak about the city of yes for economic opportunity. So the city of yes for economic opportunity is one of three citywide initiatives to modernize and update our city's zoning regulations to support small businesses, create affordable housing, and promote sustainability. Part of Mayor Eric Adams's vision for a most for a more inclusive, equitable city of yes. So um, the city of yes for economic opportunity is the second in a sequence of citywide reforms to our zoning resolution. The other two proposals are the city of yes for carbon neutrality, currently in public review. Um, this initiative is designed to help New York City meet its ambitious goal of reducing um, carbon emissions by 80% by 2050 by updating its zoning to make it easier for buildings to be greener, um, just overall help businesses and buildings become greener. And the second or the third um, amendment would be a city of City of Yes for Housing Opportunity, an inclusive citywide approach to our city's housing crisis that aims to expand and diversify the housing supply and ensure that every neighborhood does its part to help meet its housing needs and provide equitable access to housing for all New Yorkers. This proposal is expected to start public review next spring. So before we dive into the policy itself, I think it's helpful to go over what zoning governs when it comes to businesses in New York City. Zoning defines hundreds of what are called uses or business types um, and sorts them by zoning district and regulates things like what kind of business activities you can do in your space or how big your space can be. And because um, in many cases, the way that zoning regulates businesses um, hasn't been updated in more than 60 years, there are outdated and sometimes counterproductive regulations on business activities, like preventing a bar from advertising the time a band may perform, or setting strict um, square footage cap on how much space a bakery can devote to baking. Knowing that our zoning um, for businesses was in need of a refresh, we've been in a listening tour for much of last year and a half, 
asking business owners, chambers of commerce across the city, business improvement districts, industrial um, service providers, and other stakeholders across the city. Um, we've been asking them ways in which they think that Sony might be getting in the way of establishing and expanding businesses. We've met with over 100 groups, had five public informational sessions, and have heard from countless New Yorkers about the challenges you face, and this proposal has been shaped by your concerns. Um, and a lot of what we've heard um, is that actually New York City can be quite a challenging place to run a business, um, and dealing with government regulation is often frustrating, slow, confusing, um, and a lot of times illogical. And often, all of this red tape makes it difficult to invest in business, and that in turn contributes to our city being less vibrant, having fewer people able to start a business, having one more vacant storefront in our neighborhoods and our streets, um, and having more businesses have to leave neighborhoods or the city overall in order to expand. Our rules um, governing businesses, many of which are more than six years old, are holding our businesses back by either restricting them outright from locating or regulating how they do their business with some sort of old or complicated rule. That's just not clear in ways that could cost businesses time and money. Our overarching vision for this initiative is to make sure that our zoning works with our economy, and not against it. And as a result of this, we're working to make the zoning resolution more simple, more adaptable, and more modern. So how do we achieve this? First, we want to make it easier for businesses um, to find space and grow. The main way to, we propose to do this is by lifting zoning barriers so businesses can be closer to their customers. Second, we want to support growing businesses and industries by reducing obstacles for emerging business types, which can help emerging businesses thrive across the city and create jobs. Third, we want to foster more vibrant neighborhoods by ensuring that businesses contribute to active, safe, and walkable cities. And fourth, and finally, we want to create new opportunities for businesses to open in the future by creating new kinds of zoning tools that can boost job growth and business expansion in all five boroughs. So now I'll go through each of the 18 proposals um, sort of quickly. Um, please hold all of, all of your questions towards the end. Um, I would suggest just keeping track of what proposal you would like to speak about like in more detail. But for now, I'll just like go over each of the 18 proposals that we have. Okay. So for goal one, we want to make it easier for businesses to find space and grow by lifting zoning barriers so that businesses can locate closer to their customers. In most cases, our zoning rules governing businesses have not been updated since the early 1960s. And it's long past due to update our zoning to reflect and respond to today's economy. Our first six proposals do exactly that, making our zoning more simple, more adaptable, and more modern so businesses can more easily locate and grow. Proposal one, um, reactive, reactivate storefronts, sorry. So today storefronts that are deemed non-conforming face an arbitrary two-year time clock for reactivation or else they have to remain vacant. And this is a direct contributor to vacancy in our city. We're proposing to remove that time clock so that vacant storefronts can be reoccupied. Proposal two, in many places in the city, we have similar zoning districts that are located along the same corridor or on opposite sides of the street, and yet they um, allow different kinds of businesses. This is an outdated and confusing set of rules that routinely holds back business um, location and expansion. We are proposing to simplify the differences between similar kinds of zoning districts to make it easier for businesses to know where they can locate. Proposal three, Despite changes in technology and vast, um, in vastly different economy, our city's zoning rules are stuck in the 1960s with how they treat many kinds of maker businesses. We want to allow small scale clean production like pottery studio, bakeries, coffee roasters, jewelry makers, apparel design, 3D printing, and things that and things of that sort to locate in commercial districts for the first time instead of only being allowed in manufacturing districts. Proposal four, if one of the clean production businesses 
from proposal number three, so from the previous proposal, wanted to move into an empty office building. Today, they would face rules that would require them to add additional loading docks, even if they don't need them or if the building cannot physically accommodate no loading docks. We want to allow for older commercial buildings to change over time, but not mandating um, a business to tear apart the ground floor of a building to provide new loading docks. Also five, today zoning allows for many buildings to have mix, um, to have a mix of residential commercial uses, but zoning sometimes restricts businesses from being able to use the upper floors of buildings. This limits options for new buildings to be built that contain both residences and businesses or for older buildings to adapt over time. We want to enable renovations or new construction of mixed use buildings in these places where it makes sense by allowing commercial uses at the same level or above residences, provided that complete separation between uses is maintained. And proposal six, our zoning hasn't been updated um, in terms, hasn't updated the terms, excuse me, it uses to classify businesses in over 60 years. And it's fully antiquated terms like a shoddy shop, which is like cheap yarn and um, typewriter repair, make it harder for newer um, business types like cell phone repair shops to know where they can locate. We're proposing to simplify and modernize the terms we use and so we need to classify these businesses. So, goal number two. For our second goal, we want to support growing industries by reducing obstacles and zoning for emerging business types. Each of the industries highlighted in this goal, urban agriculture, life sciences, nightlife, amusements, and home-based businesses face ambiguity and outdated restrictions in our zoning. And we want to address those obstacles so that we can help emerging business types thrive across our city and create jobs across all five boroughs. Proposal seven for urban agriculture, um, businesses that want to operate indoor agriculture facilities such as vertical farming within commercial areas face uncertainty uh -huh. in today's zoning rules. We want to clarify that indoor agriculture um, is located in sea districts so more food can be grown closer to communities. Proposal eight, life science laboratories face um, confusing and outdated rules that slow the development of new facilities. We would like to make it clear that labs without potential for environmental hazard are appropriate in office settings, and we would like to expand um, where an existing special permit can be used so labs might be able to locate in the future closer to research centers like hospitals and universities. Proposal nine um, regarding nightlife. Restaurants and bars, face confusing regulations on whether they can host um, concerts, dancing, comedy shows, or open mic nights. We're simplifying the rules so that they're based on the size of the venue rather than the activity, so that you'll see only small venues in neighborhoods, um, commercial corridors, and large venues in places like Midtown. Proposal 10, zoning has outdated terms for defining experiments experiential um, amusement businesses like virtual reality or children's arcades and often restricts these kinds of businesses to Coney Island or the city's um, industrial areas. We will simplify and modernize how zoning treats amusements and recreational activities to make clear these businesses are allowed indoors and at a small scale on neighborhood streets and at larger scales in office districts. And proposal 11, for home occupations, many New Yorkers um, start their businesses at home and zoning allows for a wide range of home business types, including lawyers, jewelry makers, and music teachers. The pandemic changed how New Yorkers work from home, but zoning hasn't kept up, prohibiting specific occupations like barbers or interior decorators and other restrictions that hold back business creation. We're proposing to enable entrepreneurship with modern rules for home-based businesses while keeping in while keeping in place uh, safeguards to ensure that any home business um, any home-based business uh, is being in, is being a good neighbor. Yep. 
for our third goal, which is to foster um, vibrant neighborhoods by ensuring businesses contribute to active, safe, and walkable streets. Economic vibrancy isn't just about what occurs inside of a building, but also how a business interacts with its surroundings. Inconsistency in existing streetscape regulations, and in some cases, a total absence of zoning rules, means that there is no way to curb some of the worst outcomes of business activity spilling out into the public right-of-way or creating conditions that are unpleasant or even unsafe for passing pedestrians and cyclists. Our three proposals in this goal are designed to ensure that businesses contribute to active, safe, and walkable streets. Proposal 12, um, promoting better ground floor design. So for proposals 12, streetscape conditions like long blank walls or drive-throughs drive -throughs, break up um, retail streets and can create unpleasant and sometimes unsafe conditions for people walking past them in the sidewalk. But in vast parts of the city, there are no rules whatsoever to prevent new buildings that make these conditions worse. We're proposing to create a consistent and easy to understand baseline set of rules for commercial ground floor design Ones that are more responsive in areas with greater pedestrian activity and more relaxed in the city's more auto-oriented corridors. Proposal 13, um, auto servicing and repair businesses are typically treated as industrial businesses and located far from retail streets um, and residential neighborhoods. But some ex exceptions exist that allow auto repair and storage activities to spill out on the sidewalk in neighborhood commercial streets, creating unsafe con um, concerns and conditions for pedestrians. We're proposing to rationalize and consolidate the range of auto servicing uses in zoning in two categories, light and heavy vehicle repair and maintenance. Heavy vehicle maintenance must be licensed by the state DMV and would continue to be allowed in industrial areas, while um, light vehicle repair could locate um, elsewhere after appealing to the Board of Standards and Appeals, the BSA. And for Proposal 14, zoning does not allow for um, delivery activity within buildings except um, in industrial areas, forcing the activity to occur um, on sidewalks and streets. We're proposing to create a new type of zoning called micro distribution facility and allow these businesses to locate um, a small scale in commercial areas, encouraging deliveries to shift to alternative modes of transportation and regulating the creation of local hubs for safe and sustainable um, deliveries to occur. Um, for our fourth and final goal, uh, is to create new opportunities for businesses to open by establishing new zoning tools that can boost um, job growth and business expansion. Our zoning resolution contains many kinds of tools which can be used to initiate a discretionary process to change in areas underlying, underlying regulations, including special permits from the Board of Standards and Appeals, City Planning Commission authorizations and special permits, and zoning districts. As we're seeking to modernize our city's zoning to support business location and growth, we also need to update our zoning toolkit so that these businesses can have better access to pathways that can enable their expansion or adaption. Our last four proposals all create new kinds of discretionary zoning tools for their future economic success of the city. Proposal 15 for a campus commercial, Many large-scale residential developments, such as NYCHA campuses, are zoned as residential districts, meaning that retail services um, and maker spaces cannot easily locate within these um, campuses and placing residents of these developments further away from local goods and services. This proposal would create a CPC authorization to allow for 15,000 square feet of commercial space in existing or new construction um, on a large scale residential campus, giving residents greater access to necessities or space to grow new businesses. Proposal 16 has to do with corner stores. Some portions of New York City are not within local, within walking distance of a local retail store like um, a deli and zoning has no pathway to potentially allow for locally serving businesses to open. 
we're creating a discretionary path where businesses or a business could initiate a process to locate a new corner store, provided that the store does not generate any environmental concern or traffic congestion. Proposal 17 has to do with adapting spaces for industries like film. Um, so in some instances, uh, businesses lack options for waiving certain non-FAR related zoning rules. For instance, film studios, film studios often struggle to build out sound stages because certain zoning rules like yard requirements and setback heights um, do not allow them to. Or a clothing store um, might want to expand to occupy an empty second floor, but find that size limitations or local <laughs> location rules prevent them from doing so. We're expanding the zoning toolkit so businesses can initiate a process to waive some zoning rules on case-by-case -case basis. And proposal 18, our last proposal, um, has to do with new zoning districts, specifically new M zoning districts or manufacturing zoning districts. In some instances, um, it's in our zoning districts, not discretionary pathways to modify them. Uh, there are businesses that are, or zoning districts, excuse me, that are obsolete at this point. This is particularly true, this is particularly true um, for cities manufacturing or M districts designations. Lastly, low density options, physical design rules and parking make it impossible um, to build loft-like buildings, even in areas where they already exist. This proposal will create a range of new job intensive zoning districts um, at a range of densities and heights that expand the zoning toolkit for future rezoning. So now that we've discussed sort of all of our proposals um, and how they apply to all five boroughs, so we would like to take a minute to kind of think about how do they apply and what's the current condition of community district eight. So here's a quick snapshot of our economy here in community district eight. Um, there are around 20,000 jobs in the district with the highest share in institutional or educational and healthcare sectors. That can include things like schools, hospitals, doctor's offices, um, and services offered in in-home care um, providers or facilities. Private sector employment is at 96% of the level that it had been before the pandemic. So jobs had not been fully recovered, which lags um, the Bronx's just average economic recovery in the cities overall. Zooming in um, just a bit more into the ground level, there are about a thousand storefronts in the district that are located um, on neighborhood streets and along commercial corridors, as you can see um, on this map on the right. About 9% of the storefronts are vacant, um, a rate that is on par with the Bronx um, average storefront vacancy, but lower than the city's overall. So the proposed zoning changes that we spoke about in previous slides would make it easier to fill um, this empty storefront space by giving businesses more certainty on where they can locate and what they can do with their spaces. Um, and by removing outdated zoning restrictions on businesses from using store from storefront space. Okay. So with a better sense um, of the economic picture of the district, um, here's a more focused look on how the citywide proposals in the City of Yes for Economic Opportunity would benefit um, the neighborhoods in Community District 8. So just to explain sort of what's what we're going to be showing in the next slides, on the right here, um, we'll have a map of the district. Um, here, and I'm, I'm not sure if people can see where I'm pointing at with the cursor. Next to the map on the left, there should be um, labels for all of the commercial districts. Um, for all the commercial districts in CD8, uh, for all the residential districts together, for all the manufacturing or M districts, and for the special purpose district in um, within like the boundaries of Community District 8. So we'll just kind of go over where these districts are and like where they could apply um, what proposal. So um, across all the zoning districts within um, Community District 8, we will see the following um, proposals. So we'll have 
um, modernizing loading dock rules so buildings can more easily adapt over time. That's proposal four. Um, simplify and modernize use terms. No more telegraph or like office or typewriter repair in the zoning um, resolution. Um, another proposal that would be in place for all zoning districts within CD8 would be um, that businesses would have access to more rationalized waiver process to seek zoning modifications through the BSA or the CPC. Um, and new types of commercial and manufacturing zoning districts would be added to the zoning toolkit so that private applicants or the city could use them in future zonings. So starting with... Um, Commercial districts one. Uh, so here, and I'm trusting that you guys as residents know the area better than me, um, but here we have a map of sort of the, the major corridors or the major um, areas of business within community district eight. Um, and these are, or the following changes or proposals have been um, put forth so that they can apply to this um, zoning districts. So we have, um, again, removing the arbitrary distinctions between C1 and C2. So existing C1 districts would allow for the same mix of businesses as in CD2. Um, I believe, uh, for example, just an example, around the Kingsbridge bid, there is um, CD1 and CD2 next to each other. Um, so what that would mean is that across the street from CD1, you could not have some of the uses that you could have in CD2. Um, so this proposal would basically make it so that both CD1 or commercial district one or in commercial district two could have the same um, proposals throughout. So no more differentiation that doesn't make any sense in terms of geography. Um, Next would be allowing small scale clean production of businesses such as food and beverage makers, jewelry makers, um, and apparel makers up to 5,000 square feet. Um, commercial uses would be able to occupy the second floor of mixed use buildings um, and would be able to fill space that a doctor's office might leave empty. Um, a simplified and modernized citywide use framework for classifying businesses in zoning, urban agriculture businesses, which can operate in greenhouses today, could operate within buildings instead, so within buildings um, in one of the highlighted districts in orange. Um, and the rest of the, um, the proposals that you can see on the screen. And again, we can go come back to this and um, talk through about whatever question you guys have in more detail, um, just to be cautious of time. Here on the map, um, again, you can see the CD2. Again, um, this can be found in like major corridors, so like Broadway um, and further up north and around like the Kingsbridge area. So the proposals on the screen, um, similar to the proposals in C1, can, um, can be found and will be like be enacted if through the proposal that we are um, bringing you to the, to you guys today. Sorry. Okay, um, CD4, um, Community District 8 only has, um, you can see it here along Broadway and around the 230th area, one chunk of uh, land that is known as C4. Um, I believe this is where the Broadway Plaza is today. Um, and the proposals on the screen would be able to um, benefit from um, at this districts. Um, for C5 and C6, we don't have any of those districts mapped in CD8, but just for um, clarity, these districts are found, of course, in other areas of the city, but um, they are not found in CD8. But just for your clarity, they are part of the proposal overall. Um, here, just quickly, the proposals that will have to do with CD with C5 that would apply to C5. Um, and here are the ones that would apply to um, C6. And again, we don't have any C5 or C6 in the district. Um, for residential districts, and you can see in yellow that um, CD8 is mostly made up of residential districts ranging from R1 to like 
are seven in some places. Um, here, a few proposals would be um, able to, to uh, be enacted in these areas. Um, and like I said before, most of the, the district is our is is zone as residential um, proposal one. So vacating um, existing storefronts, proposal 11, uh, which is mostly useful for um, updating rules for housing occupations. Um, proposal 15, that has to do with permitting local retail in NYCHA campuses and other residential campuses. Um, and proposal 16, that would create a path and a process for potentially allowing new corner stores in residential areas. Um, for the M districts in the area, we have um, quite a few, I would say, M districts mapped across CD8. Most of them are located around Kingsbridge again. Um, and here are the few proposals that would be um, affected in M districts. Um, just quickly. And then um, lastly, for special purpose districts, um, the one special purpose district in Community Board 8 is the Special Natural Area District, or does not. Um, does not is uh, mapped to its entirety, just as residential. Um, so only a few of the proposals would actually affect the SNAT. Um, proposal number two for ground floor uses. Um, proposal six for um, simplifying modernizing use terms. But again, this is mostly mapped as residential. So the, the use is residential. Um, and proposal number 12, that would be enhancing corridor design rules. Okay. Um, lastly, I do want to go over um, just quickly this roadmap that we have for the process um, to come for the, the City of Yes for Economic Opportunity. After more than a year um, of getting in front of as many audiences as we can, presenting our ideas of solutions and the problems that businesses are facing today, um, and soliciting your feedback and questions about these proposals. We're in the process of going before every community board like we are today um, for a formal public review. This process will culminate in a city council vote sometime next spring. Um, and with that, I think we can get started with questions. So I'm gonna keep sharing my screen. So I'm sure you guys will want to jump to different um, slides, but happy to start taking your questions now. Ready? Uh, first of all, um, is this a text change in any way, or do you have text, precise text for these proposals? Uh, yes, this is a text change. Um, precisely most, if not all, of our proposals have to do with changing the zoning resolution. So we are changing most of the... Um, you have a draft of the proposed language of the changes. Do you have one? We do, and it was shared, I believe, a couple of times um, with the board yeah. and just with the city overall, but we can forward it again. We'll make sure you have the link to that. Yeah. My point is this, that has to be distributed to each board member before a vote, because as I will show you in a few moments, the vagary of the approaches leaves all sorts of loopholes. So let me give you a very quick example. At the end, you pointed out that there could be a change in SNAD to approve certain things, one of them being small, clean manufacturing in those kind of areas, or small shops. How about rope making brownies? That's a very nice thing to make. It's very clean. Uh, the after effect of making the brownies is a little bit different. Is that something you want to have there? Do you want to have it right next to a school? Do you want to have the arcades that you're proposing right next to a school? Uh, Urban agriculture in commercial areas, growing weed in, on Broadway is a very good idea, but I'm not so sure it's in the public interest. Nightlife, we've had that experience. 
up on Bro on Riverdale Avenue. We had nightlife going like crazy until Laura got people together to stop that nonsense because every resident of the area was screaming. Amusements, wonderful. We'll have crap uh, slot machines right next to Pierre uh, Thomas Christians. I need to see the language. I need to see what you're talking about. I'll give you another one. Home business, a good neighbor. Who is it? What kind? What's a home business? Is a brothel a home business? And is that a good neighbor? Maybe a good service, maybe productive, not necessarily a good neighbor. Better ground floor designs. Now with the design police, so that the architects cannot design to fit my business need. Appeal to the BSA. Now that one really troubles me. We now have one of the first, one of the first BSA that has had no claims of anybody being able to mess with it. Roman has done a superb job. But if you start providing appeals to BSA and things like auto repairs, you're going to go back to the old days. This, this variance is a $5,000 variance. That's a $10,000 variance. You can't do that. Next. New York City Housing Authority commercial space. Now, that one, I will tell you, I have fought tooth and nail as a member of New York City Housing Development Corporation to keep the green space in the NYCHA facilities as green space. This opens it up to not just green space, not just more buildings, not just parking lots, but all sorts of bodegas and everything else. The people there are not living or seeking to live in a sardine can, nor seeking to live in places that are not fit for people and fit for living. Unless I see the language, you're going to do that. Loft style zoning. I love that one. We have loft style zoning on the lower west side, below Canal Street. And at the present time, they are spending a bloody fortune getting rid of the lofts because they are not rentable. And just, unless we see some language, this makes no sense. It rationalized the waiver process in the BSA. Great. It's motherhood, it's apple pie, but what does it provide? All I'm saying to you, you cannot rationally expect people who want to look at this to pass on it unless they have the language and the specifics. And uh, that my point to you is I, for one, will absolutely oppose it unless we start to see some language here. Thank you. Um, yeah, totally understandable. Um, the language was shared to all um, boards, but we can reshare the language um, for your next steps. Have it again. We do? Yeah, we have it. Yeah, we did. We never saw it. So it's like 600 pages. Yeah, exactly. It's a huge. Oh, it was emailed to us. Yes, it was emailed oh, okay. to everybody. All right. All right. <laughs> and, and I have a question. And may I just respond slight, a little bit with, uh, to what Chuck said? I, now, I have not perused this thoroughly because it is 664 pages. However, after sitting through two different presentations and looking at it, albeit a cursory look, many of the issues that you raise are not necessarily the intention of any of the proposed amendments. So. I encourage everyone to take a look at them and look at them in their details. But essentially, with the, without getting into each and every one of them, the idea is, is to the economy and the commercial ecosystem, based on the zoning, not suitable to 2023. Great. The economy has changed. The commercial ecosystem has changed. And right now, there are some significant gaps within between the zoning and the needs within the evolution of the economy here in New York. Some of that is because of other interventions that happened in the past, and some of it is because of the way technology and consumer tastes and preferences and everything have evolved. 
So I encourage everyone to look at each one individually, but it is, this is a way, let me just give you a quick example. I hope this doesn't become tangential. But we have a thing called Etsy economy. People shop on Etsy now. Small back manufacturing. We don't have large scale manufacturing anymore. It used to be 40% of our economy. Now it's less than 2%. So the only way we can produce things is through sort of what in the old world they call artisans. And we have this, but people are doing this in their homes technically illegally because it's not zoned for that. They might be shipping and they might have deals with UPS and some other shippers, but for them to operate and to expand their business, they would need a loading dock. But they're not producing anything that would require a loading dock. Manufacturing is different now. This is not large-scale manufacturing. This is more refined manufacturing at the very end stages of manufacturing. I'll give you another example. The, some of the use groups have noise, uh, fumigation, like uh, odors, and all these other restrictions. But 3D printing doesn't produce any of that. When they've done mixed-use zoning, like in some of these proposals, in other parts of the city, and I think one was done in, in the very lower parts of Manhattan, the architects use new technologies for noise mitigation, uh, different uh, ways to mitigate sort of how fumes will travel, and those things have worked successfully. They, they allow for sort of some of the changes that they're proposing. So I, I encourage everyone to take a, 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 a look at this and try to look at it through the, the way the economy has changed and it has changed significantly. Another one is the, the truck, the trucks, the, um, the UPS delivery trucks, trucks, delivery trucks. I mean, it's a significant problem. I mean, I just came from Manhattan. You have no idea, I mean, you do have an idea because you see it all the time. So this is designed to sort of mitigate that, right? Because delivery is not going anywhere. Where we're, people are going to use their, you know, they're going to use Amazon. They're going to use different things. So the changing those to adapt to the new environment is very important. So uh, I appreciate the presentation, and I think it's something we should we should consider and consider approving. Let me make a point in response, if I may. I couldn't agree with you more that it's outdated. There are people like me and my firm who get paid $1,500 an hour to take bland language and distort it. And we do it. That's why I say it's essential that you have the language so you can play with it and see what it is. Number one, let's deal for just a minute with the UPS truck. I think that's a wonderful idea doing something in the middle of the block. But do you know why you have the double, triple, and quadruple parking? What UPS and every one of those outfits do is you get tickets all the time. That's how the uh, people at DO, uh, Department of Transportation, meet their quotas. They get four, five, six, six. Then they put them in a the box. This is an actual fact. They put it in a box. Once a week, they take the box over to a special section of the court. It's weighed, and they're given a number. They don't care. There's a guy who carries the box. He knows it's going to be X dollars a pound, and that's it. Cost of doing business. It's cheaper than a parking spot. Yeah, that's why the so trucks are over here. here. It's cheaper than a parking well, spot. But that's why if they let them do... Redistributing hubs, like they're just doing it on the sidewalk now because they're not allowed to rent a storefront and do it inside. So this would let them I maybe agree have with fewer you, illegally you parked see, cars. My concern is based on if you do not provide specificity. Frankly, I hate the idea of permitting only because it depends on who issues the permits and how clean they are. But it's far preferable to have permitting for specific uses than to have it in a fashion where it can be used to disadvantage the community, one after another. The entertainment one you just mentioned, 
How many weeks did it take you, Laura, to get that place done? Weeks or months, am I right? Which place? Upper, on Upper uh, Riverdale Avenue. Yeah. yeah. It was an event space in a yeah. residential yeah. facility. Yes. It was illegal, oh, and we got it closed. Sarah, may I just make a suggestion that you can you can um, is it the one that's moderate. 664 pages? No, no, but, yes, yeah, yeah, but I'm asking yeah. you to if because you know Chuck and I have opinions about this. We want, I want everyone to share their opinion, but I think it would be a uh, more productive if if you called on us individually, like yeah. David. Just I want to respond that David had his hand up. So. Okay. And just let's, let's, let's acknowledge Farah. Is that, if everyone's okay with that, we'll not fair. We'll acknowledge right, each well, individual. I just walked in, so I don't know. <laughs> David, David, David. Okay, David. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so Camilla, I, I, in principle, I, I like where you're heading on this, but uh, as usual, I'm concerned about the unintended consequences. Um, and, and not only is there not specificity in the language, <clears throat> but I don't know what, if any, provisions are made for um, uh, ensuring mod proper modification of building code and fire code. For example, a home business could create huge fire dangers in residential buildings. Allowing commercial um, enterprises on upper floors could create structural problems. Um, and you know, these are things that need to be addressed by the building code and the fire code. And of all things, New York City um, survives because it's got a superior uh, set of building and fire codes. Um, and I'm concerned that um, you, that this proposal, and I could be wrong because I have not read the 664 pages, but I'm concerned that this, this proceeding without sufficient um, uh, restraint uh, acknowledging issues about fire and building codes. If I may respond to that, uh, we've worked with the Department of Buildings for well over a year now on the very beginning stages right up until the present moment on each part of this proposal. And when it, as it relates to home occupations in particular, I just want to note how little we're actually changing here uh, because the, the zoning today allows for a wide range of home occupations. But there are specific kinds of businesses that are prohibited in the zoning, for example, stockbrokers, interior designers, and barbers, not, not allowed under zoning, but you can be a lawyer or a doctor, have people visit you in your home. So as with home occupations and every other part of the proposal, what we've done is we've worked with the Department of Buildings just to make sure that, uh, that these proposals are making their jobs easier. And then as we get into inf implementation phase, making sure that any updates to the building code are taken into account where they need to be. So we don't do this in a vacuum. Zoning is, of course, implemented by the Department of Buildings. So we want to make sure that what we're proposing works for their purposes. And we've, we've done that here. That's a building code. You're also making provisions <coughs> for fire code update, right? Well, similarly, yes. So once, once the zoning changes are adopted, then we work through the process with the fire department the same way. Um, and DOB themselves, of course, work with, with the fire department as well in making sure that all codes are in sync. There are also places in this proposal where we have to work with our mechanical code, uh, as well as uh, other aspects, not just the, the building code itself. Thank you. But I also did want to make sure that I address something that was brought up earlier, and that's SNAD. So just to clarify, because your particular uh, special district is not one that has commercial zoning as any part of it, the, the streetscape proposals would actually not apply. They only apply to areas that are zoned as commercial underlying. I have a question about uh, the schedule, the timeline. Uh, we got this presentation tonight. Thank you. Um, when is a vote due from community boards? What is the timeline? Sure. So your 60-day clock technically has not even started yet uh, because we we had our referral last Monday and our commissioner, Dan Garodnik, sent around an email with a link to the proposed text as well as a whole bunch of other uh, resources for you all. Later this week, we'll begin the the transmittal when we, when we send that package over to you formally and that starts the 60-day clock. 
after which point you have 60 days. And just noting that both parts of City of Yes for Economic Opportunity are non ULERP. And so what that means is you actually, um, you are not bound to 60 days. The vote, of course, we, we want your vote. We want your feedback. And in fact, we want your feedback on all 18 of the proposals individually as well. And we can talk more about how to vote and what the, the process can look like there. Um, but that that 60 day clock won't begin until the formal transmittal package is sent to you all later this week. I'm sorry. Um, we have a ULERP and a non ULERP, but the timeline will be the same for both. Yeah, so I, I noticed that on your agenda, and I just wanted to correct that both actions are non ULERP. Good. It said it on, you know, the thing we received from DCP. So. Yeah, we we unfortunately caught that too late. It was is admittedly a typo, but just to be clear, they are both non ULERP. <laughs> And just one uh, point that has been made by others. I also am concerned about businesses at home because they can change the whole character of a community or a building because of increased transit population, people coming, parking. Um, it, it, it would have to be really uh, regulated. As I said, I haven't seen the language, but uh, it does change the character. Um, and just, you know, that question, why can't I start a business at home? There's a lot of reasons, and they have to do with your neighbors. Yeah, yeah th thank you for the comment on that. And what I would say is you can take a look at what we've proposed, the the, mm -hmm. the actual language of what we've proposed on our website, nyc.gov slash yes, economic opportunity. But much of what we have proposed is actually just based on the existing zoning. So if you go to section 12-10 of our zoning resolution and you search for home occupation, what you'll find there under sections A and B, uh, we're, we're keeping the, the safeguards that are put in place for home occupation. So you can't sell anything that you didn't produce on site. You can't have exterior displays or a display that's visible from the outside. You cannot store any materials outside of your principal uh, structure or an accessory structure. And if you're in an R1 or R2 district, there's additional regulations on um, signage. And then you can't make any alterations to your structure. And, and this is perhaps the most notable, you can't do anything that in a layman's term would create a nuisance. Uh, and like other parts of the zoning resolution, if that were to come into place and, and you were generating a nuisance as a home business, DOB gets involved, DOB can issue violations uh, for, for, for that. And so we're, we're retaining That's all right. that. We've talked to DOB and they, they think that this works. So we wanna retain those existing parts of our zoning and the parts that we're adjusting have to do with the, uh, the size. Uh, the the percentage of space that you can have within a dwelling unit that's devoted to a home-based business and the, uh, the the number of employees associated um, and then the home occupation types that are not allowed. So those are the three specific types of changes being proposed, but we are retaining all the existing parts of section 1210-B. Thank you. I just want to be clear. The text, the language is 600 pages. And it, it uh, I'm sure we, ha we when we comment, there might be things we like, many things mm -hmm. that we don't like. Is this text going to change ever? Or the text that we're looking at now, this is it? Yeah, two two questions. What so I want to make sure I so I want to make sure I answer both. It'll change. It'll change so, it's okay. Right. So this is the start of the formal process, of course. So uh, what we're wanting for feedback now is we want your opinion and your, your vote on the overall package, but we also are providing a worksheet where you can indicate you, whether you support each of the 18. So let's say that you like, just to make up some numbers, two, three, five, and 12. You have some concerns about 14 and 16, and you would say absolutely not to number 18. We want to know that. And we want to understand the, the concerns that you have for each of those 18, because it helps us in the process as we go through and we prepare for 
um, any changes we might make before the, the city planning commission. And it also helps your, your local city council member understand what your opinions are. Because if you vote just yes okay. or no on the overall package, it's much harder for us to know uh, what, what your opinions are. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Bob Bender was next, and then I see Julie Reyes chair. Has her had her hair hand raised before? Uh, yeah. So first of all, I'm I'm glad to hear that um, you are looking for feedback on each of the 18 different proposals, because I I see a lot of variation in these 18 proposals. Some seem uh, more or less benign, and and uh, as you said actually uh, reflect the current reality, such as home offices. Many of us were operating a home office during the pandemic for six months, sometimes a year. Um, and it, for a, a lot of businesses, it worked out very well. Um, so that's just recognizing reality. On the other hand, introducing agriculture or, uh, or laboratories into uh, certain commercial spaces that's a much more complicated uh, proposition, and I think requires much more careful scrutiny. So there's there's a, a wide variety here, and I think the language is important. We really do need to look at these 18 proposals individually. The one that um, jumped out at me is the same one that our land use chair mentioned, which is uh, uh, commercial space in NYCHA. Uh, it seems to me there's only two possible ways to do that. Either you introduce a structure into the NYCHA complex somewhere, and you're going to have to take something away to build that structure, or you put it on the ground floor of the buildings. There are apartments on the ground floors of those buildings. Uh, so you would actually be reducing the affordable housing by putting in that commercial space. Now, that's, that's my response after seeing the presentation. I haven't read the language. Uh, it may be uh, more nuanced than, than I understand. Uh, but I, I guess what I'm saying, not just to you, but to all of my colleagues, is we really do have to look at all 18 of these proposals and, and consider them individually. And I, I think, quite frankly, we've got a big job ahead of us. Yeah, we, we do want your feedback on all 18, and we're here to help you through any questions you might have in that process. So please don't hesitate to reach out and uh, we can get you responses to anything you might be wanting. But on your your question on NYCHA, there's actually a third possibility that I wanted to point out, and that is several existing NYCHA campuses, other large-scale residential campuses, where you have ground floors that are not housing. And today, you can have community facilities, you can have community spaces, you can have uh, just underused space that NYCHA is using for their own offices. And what we've heard from them is that in some instances, they have plans to redevelop the ground floor to include things that could be things like a small retailer maker space for residents. Um, a, a Center for an Urban Future came out with a recent report on the need for shared commercial kitchen space in particular at NYCHA and being able to encourage entrepreneurship that we saw a lot during the pandemic. And so this helps enable some of those goals that NYCHA has. Uh, we wanna make sure that as it's doing that, it's creating a pathway it doesn't doesn't foretell any sort of, of outcome. Uh, and certainly when it comes to public housing, we wanna make sure that the, the proposal provides options for, for the goals that NYCHA has in conjunction with their residents. Okay, Charles. I have three points if I may. One of the codes that is frequently mentioned that has not in the subject of significant debate as to the code's veracity and sustainability, building code had wholesale changes over the years. Neither has the housing maintenance code. Why? Because what we did there, and both of them were done during my tenure, what we did there is we hired Columbia University for one, and we hired Cooper Union for the other to pull the agencies together. And that's what's missing here, if I may. When you go to DOB, they will look at it through a jaundiced eye that is jaundiced in favor of what their perception of a code should be and what they have to enforce. When you go to the fire department, it's the same thing. 
using an outside educational institution provides a unifying bond that gets you somewhere. Columbia did the housing maintenance code for something like $100,000 because it was something that was important to them. Cooper Union did the building code for the same reason, obviously cut prices. That's something that you should be doing here rather than going it alone because the Department of Buildings, the only entity that's going to enforce this except through private enforcement. The Department of Buildings is not equipped to do much of this enforcement, nor is it inclined to do it. Take a look at SNAD. SNAD has not been enforced by the Department of Buildings unless somebody's got a poker up their butt. They just don't do it. Ignore it. So that's what's going to happen here. If you, however, have a building code provision that was written, bearing in mind each agency after it has been talked to, you have much better response. That's number one. Number two, the NYCHA concept as follows as a problem. NYCHA is now in the market of privatizing every housing project in the city of New York. It has come to the Housing Development Corporation, and I have used the governor's authority to say no. So, for example, they say, listen, we have a bunch of dumpsters here. Let us put something, a structure there. People need green space. They need places where they can go. This is not a rabbit warren. It's whole housing for people. And my point to you on this, please, don't get taken in by this. You're good people. You're planners. You are the optimum people in terms of making a city fit for living and fit for people. But you must understand, there is a deliberate attempt by a number of entities including those in the real estate industry, to privatize all housing authority structures. I have voted against every single one of them and will continue to do so. I urge you to be careful because you're the thin edge of the wedge in terms of putting commercial facilities in there. If I have commercial facilities, why can't I just put up a little building? Careful, please, I beg you. Those folks need every bit of care and attention. They are the most fragile folk in this town. The last point I would like to make to you is the following. I would urge you, I did not know you had circulated the text or that there was text. I'd like to see it and I will go through it. What I would like to suggest you do is if you could do some sort of a key. So circulating a copy of this schedule or presentation, say item number one, you will yeah. find all the material elements on pages three for 14. So make it easier for people to read yeah. those things that are of interest to them. Camilla, we have that, if you wouldn't mind going a couple slides forward. Fine. If you have it, that's fine. Perfect. I, as I said, I haven't seen it. We'll make sure that you all have a copy of this following today's presentation. We have this presentation also? Yes. We, yes. Yeah. We can get all of this, yeah. I believe, Matt, as well, the, um, the text also has, like, highlight points where the changes are made. That's so right. You'll be able to just go and, like, see what changed. So it's not just you, like, doing, like, find the seven differences with the zoning text amendment. We do highlight what, what has changed. So, or in some cases, what hasn't changed and what we've just rearranged for the sake of making the zoning resolution as a whole easier to understand. So you keep on mentioning the 664 pages and yes, it's a lot of pages. And I will note that uh, much of that page length is because we are either remo removing the sections to make them more coherent and, and logical or we are updating each and every one of the literally thousands of ways in which a particular use 
is defined or or cited and then all of the cross references to all of that so it's it it feels like a lot and it is uh we are we are updating our regulations for businesses for the first time in 62 years um and so that's why we're here to help both tonight and over the coming months we want to make sure that we have all of your questions addressed uh and that you have all of the information you need to make a come to a sound decision on each of the 18. Can I ask one more question? To make it's more to make a point. If you were today to adopt the proposals you have in terms of a lot making it quote easier to convert empty office buildings into apartments. You need to get the benefit of the people from fire and buildings for another reason. Most of the buildings that are empty today you want to convert into residential in order to do it you must will have to install all new plumbing throughout the entire building you will need all new waste lines you will need the cost of that is prohibitive so that for example on one building that i am aware of in the wall street area it will cost more to do that than to tear the building down and build a new one so you need to get the input of people in the construction trades, otherwise we're spinning wheels and we're holding out illusory objectives. Thank you for, for that Hi. feedback. I do want to be clear that no part of City of Yes for economic opportunity facilitates conversion of office to residential. Uh, that That change is being proposed or being studied as part of the city of yes for housing opportunity, which should be for formal public review next spring. Okay, I'm going to call on Jessica Soso. She's on Zoom. She's a committee member. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Farah. Um, I wanted to ask something I don't see are just case studies that that resulted in these proposals. You know, for example, like uh like the 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 loading dock the loading dock one right like do you have an example or a case study of where that was used as economic uh space and and how that affected a, a community like new york you know something that can help people you know bring brightness to these proposals right and they can re-envision re the community because i do i i feel like i wouldn't I would feel almost rushed to make to vote on these proposals without knowing how, you know, what case studies exist for them that that are in support and in opposition. And then so then we can actively review how how it would affect CB8 um, and then just have a more productive conversation about it. So the question is, do case studies exist? Can they be shared? Right. Because. I'm under the impression that these proposals came because you guys, you know, anticipated some case studies where this where this does work. Yeah, and we're happy to share and follow up. Uh, I wouldn't maybe use the word case study so much as as white papers and research. And there's several ways in which we've heard uh, for each of these 18, the rationale and the reason for for these changes. So one of the ways we hear it is through our, our zoning help desk. That's something that we can't necessarily share and compile, but each and every day we get calls at the department from people who are trying to understand what they can do and where zoning might be getting in the way. And so that helps inform some of this. Part of that comes also from research that we've done as an agency in years before the pandemic and, and since the pandemic. For example, uh, we did through 24 different commercial retail corridors across the city in 2019, looking at all the various uh, ways in which some corridors have higher vacancy than others, what kinds of storefronts are vacant. Uh, and, and through that work, a lot of our proposals under goal one were, were formulated, understanding the ways in which there are, of course, many reasons why a storefront may be vacant. Zoning is some of them, and in some cases more directly than others. So wanting to address those. And then, and then lastly, what I would add is that over the last year and a half, we've 
done quite a bit of engagement speaking with business improvement districts, with industrial service providers, folks whose job day in, day out is working with small businesses and trying to help them overcome barriers to location and growth. And so some of the proposals and the work that we've done uh, either come through that engagement or through more specific um, focus groups, if you will, with, with folks like the urban agriculture community, understanding what community growers need to be able to uh, to be able to start a food business or trying to understand uh, what kinds of work need to be done in order to, uh, for example, uh, being able to locate a, a corner store where today you would need to do a full rezoning of a commercial overlay that may not be appropriate for many businesses that are either seeking to locate or want to change their space. And so creating that pathway in zoning where it doesn't exist today it doesn't guarantee new corner stores. In fact, you all as a community board would, would similar to the process we're under today, they would be required to, to refer to the community board, um, but it provides a pathway. So I think for each of the, the 18, there are ways in which we've, we've understood the need for these proposals. Uh, we'll make sure to send over some of those, those white papers and research that we have. It's, it's available on our website, but we'll make sure the links are more directly for you, for you to read and, and take a look at. Uh, just can I just piggyback on that for uh, Jessica, the um, Urban Manufacturers Alliance has uh, several search papers based on what other cities and communities have done in terms of adapting to uh, the technological advances in the modern economy in terms of production and distribution. So the, uh, Urban Manufacturing Alliance they have a website and they have lots of resources that you can look up. And lastly, I, I mentioned uh -huh. earlier the Center for an Urban Future white paper on, on NYCHA entrepreneurship uh, and the need for space for makers in particular, food production in particular, and be able to accelerate entrepreneurship for residents of NYCHA. Uh, and so that's a, one of the ways in which um, we're, we're seeing research being done in the field um, getting translated into zoning proposals here. Okay. Yeah, Julie had her hand up earlier. Julie Reyes, chairperson, can ask your question. Hi, thank you. Um, it's, this is going to the item number 15. Bob pretty much has. With the NYCHA, NYCHA has many ways to reach their residents and you're advising that you would like to get feedback from everyone as possible. Has NYCHA or will NYCHA reach out to all the residents within NYCHA to ask what their opinions and feedback is on item number 15 specifically? Not to give them the 600 page brochure, but specifically target their section and give them the information and get feedback from every NYCHA resident. I don't want to speak for NYCHA, and so I, I won't uh, this evening, but what I will say is that the Proposal 15, as well as everything under the fourth goal here, these are future discretionary actions. So none of them are, are created as of right as a result of these changes. They're new pathways. So if it were to be the case that NYCHA were to use this tool in the future in order to, say, create a shared commercial kitchen, then in order to do so, they they would conduct um, both community outreach with whatever context and whichever uh, campus they were seeking to locate that activity, but it would also require environmental review and it would also require community board feedback and it would go to the city planning commission. And so there's a, there's a vast difference between something that is done without, uh, that is done as of right and is non-discretionary versus what is described in Proposal 15, which is a, a new type of discretionary process that would necessarily involve uh, feedback and, and community input in order to, to occur. But in the 60-day review in the Correct. public that hearing, leading up to that, that you're, you're not even going, to, would you even ask NYCHA to attempt to reach out to their residents to give them the information and to get feedback from them now as you're doing through every community? I mean, certainly we we would suggest that with them, and and we've we've worked with NYCHA on this proposal, and so um, we'll 
continue to uh, to be able to make sure that the proposal reflects um, what we've heard and what we know is needed. So you wouldn't do it now. You're waiting so until after what the is not correct. Um, I think been notified just to clarify, sorry. Facilities to NYCHA properties as part of an attempt to privatize them. They have deliberately not, and they've said they're not going to. They are in the borough of the Brooklyn. They were on before the New York City Housing Development Corporation earlier this year. So I referred to the dumpsters and that. The communities had no clue. The one on Mount Eden didn't have a community involvement. Please, I know you don't know it because you don't have to live with this stuff. I thank goodness just a visit. Something you ought to know, in theory, maybe they would do it. They don't actually do it. I call on David Gelman. Yes. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. You know, Chuck raised a very interesting point before regarding uh, uh, institutions like Columbia and uh, Cooper Union. Um, if you look at this proposal of uh, um, uh, economic opportunity with four goals and 18 proposals, following the um, uh, presentation of the um, carbon neutrality, which was, I think, four or five goals and 17 proposals, and presumably the housing opportunity will be a similarly large um, proposal or series of goals and proposals, uh, and probably entailing, you know, five to 700 pages each. So we're talking about you know, well over a thousand pages of material for community boards throughout the city to digest. And we it may not necessarily have the skill set to do that, but uh, entities like Columbia and uh, Cooper Union and others around the city, Pratt and other institutions, could be very helpful. They, they could be helpful in making your case to the community boards, it could, but it would be very helpful for us. I mean, I don't think you want to foist this upon us. I think you want to um, get our our buy-in. Um, most projects you do want buy-in from the the uh, constituency, it'd be it corporate or educational or physical uh, 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 geographical constituency. I think you want to reach out to some entities such as those uh, educational institutions that could help digest this for us. Um, you, these proposals are, proposals are very interesting. The goals are laudable, but at you know, well over a thousand pages, just nearly impossible for the community boards to digest. Cody had her hand up. I want to second David. This is a lot of information. 60 days, that's, at, we, you know, it's almost like we got a three-day review on every single proposal. That's all I want to say. Anyone here have questions? I yes. see one community member had a question. David and, and Jessica, I just want to say we, we hear you. We we know and we're we're here to to help both tonight and in the future. Uh, and we also have a number of resources on our website to help you understand each of these 18. So we have, as, as Camilla mentioned, we have annotated zoning text where we have notes in the margins about the nature of each of the changes and why, uh, why some changes are being made and others look the way they do. Um, we're also, we have uh, one pagers or, or on particular topic areas to help you understand a particular topic. I mentioned to Jessica earlier, a series of one pagers that will make sure, or uh, excuse me, white papers will make sure are made available. And then we also have the presentation itself where, where Camilla walked through uh, each of the proposals and where they would apply geographically speaking. And then we have this, this slide that's up here where we have the, the technical reference to each of the, the zoning resolution sections associated with each of the 18. So we're here to help answer any questions you have in the coming weeks and months. Uh, and please just let us know how we can be helpful in that process. Just it. 
Can I add a suggestion to you? If you could defer a formal referral until either the very end of November or the very beginning of December, people will be able to use a quiet period to review all of this. <clears throat> Things quiet down over Christmas. Nobody forced us to be members of the community. Oh, yeah, I thank you. Um, I, uh, all right, is everyone here? Oh, everyone's still here. I'm sorry. So, the I had a question about for the planners on the call. Um, uh, I, I mean, the the housing proposals have also been put out, but not, I guess not in detail. And I was kind of wondering how these commercial proposals kind of interact with the housing ones. Like, for example, in Riverdale, along like the Broadway corridor, a lot of the development over the last couple of years has been strictly commercial. And like you see a lot of redevelopments like uh, where BJ's is and where that place with the next to BJ's with the key I can see from my window so there's like a cube storage there's a lot of there's there's where Staples is and everything is is strictly commercial there's no mixed use along the Broadway corridor where uh you know with these huge redevelopments that happened and, and I'm wondering is there I know the housing proposals talking about allowing housing above commercial strictly commercial districts sort of like those low rise uh one story commercial districts that are all over the city and that are in Riverdale and Riverdale Avenue for example um but like is there how are those two goals going to interact like getting more housing and also uh i know it doesn't directly relate to the economic opportunity plans cuz i see that's more about spreading out, you know, businesses, which makes sense to me, but I'm just curious what your thoughts are. Thanks. Uh, sure. Um, just to clarify for Matt, who's not as familiar with, with the district, I think you're talking about Broadway along like around 238th. Um, yeah, 238, but also you mentioned it before, like Broadway Plaza. Is that yeah. the one on 231st? Mm -hmm. That's another example where yeah. it's like it was redeveloped and it's strictly commercial. And mm -hmm. it seems like it was like a wasted opportunity. Yeah. So, um, so for, for well, Matt and Camille, just, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, just one point on that. Those developments happen like that, as you might imagine, as of right. Um, so the zoning that's zone like the, the map zoning in those lots allowed for the development that happened there so there was a, as far as I'm, I'm concerned there was no kind of, of um, changes that could have been made because they were as of right um, mm -hmm. I think Matt can also speak a bit more like how um, both economic opportunity and housing opportunity will interact um, and you are correct that we haven't gone fully into um public review for the housing opportunity tax amendment because we're not there yet but we have thought about how all of our proposals for city of yes to interact with each other at different levels um just quickly for housing opportunity the the key goal for that tax amendment or for the proposal is to sort of increase housing a bit at a time in throughout every district we're not doing um and we could like discuss this a bit further we're not doing a rezoning of like many zoning like districts we're not rezoning like multiple neighborhoods it's more like changing zoning so that housing can happen um a bit more and not like a, a whole rezoning for for example for the the businesses that we were describing along like broadway um for that to happen that would need like a, a rezoning from like what they were which is um broadway plaza is like a manufacturing district that would have needed to be rezoned to a rezoning to a residential district for housing to happen there. So that's just right. sort of like what's happening there. But Matt, if you could like, if you have any opinion on how both of the proposals kind of like live with each other and interact. Yeah, I, I, 
Ryan, I appreciate the question because, of course, uh, City of Yes is is all three as an umbrella for for the kinds of changes we'd like to make to our zoning. There are three thematic areas, and um, I want to be clear that there are no proposals in this text, economic opportunity, that directly facilitate the creation of new housing, just as there are no proposals in here that directly facilitate in a change in density for any building. So this is all about repurposing space from one use to another. So that's that's the universe we're working with here. But we know that within that universe, for example, along a commercial corridor that is 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 primarily one street one level of of commercial today, um, it is a number of different ways in which the the zoning for housing is actually what gets in the way of repurposing the commercial space. So let me say what I mean here by saying um, that in particular, the parking requirements associated with housing production. This is our so-called missing middle of housing where you see this topology of three and four story buildings along a main street across most of the city. But most of all of that predates the 61 zoning, which effectively outlawed that, that building type in the future. So part of the, the changes that are being looked at in housing opportunity are to allow for that how, type of topology of housing to come back and reinvigorate our main streets, which in turn will make it easier to repurpose underused or empty storefront space that, that today may, may be struggling to, uh, to get updated, to have what it needs in order to, um, to be attractive to, to new stores. And so that's a way in which there's indirect uh, interaction between between economic opportunity and housing opportunity, um, just as one example. But there's nothing in in this proposal that directly facilitates the creation of new housing. Okay, uh, Nick. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. I, I have one. Could I ask one follow up? Just uh, so, is there any consideration of of? I know the goal is to create more business opportunities, which makes sense to me. But if there's a lot of manufactured manufacturing quote unquote zoning, which none of these places along Broadway, which is along the one train are really manufacturing, but it's considered manufacturing. And I'm wondering, is there a proposal to kind of move away from that kind of zoning strictly period as like something to that doesn't make sense next to transit? Uh, and that's more of a housing question for that, that portion of the plan, but yeah, I, th I think what ask, we do have a housing uh, opportunity meeting coming up, and we'd like to limit those questions to there and focus on economic development and land use questions tonight. Uh, Matt and Camila, could you just talk to, um, in terms of city of yes for economic opportunity, how the uses, the antiquated use group allowances in the M1 through M3 zones would be changed. Sure. Uh, and this this also gives me a chance to to semi-respond to, to Ryan's question in the, the sort of question Correct. of what is the future of, of M zoning in our industrial space generally? Uh, and so this is an area where we've also recognized that there are, are antiquated use terms just as there are for our commercial areas. So things like shoddy manufacturing that Camilla mentioned earlier is uh, is when I first came to city planning, I had to learn what that meant because it's clearly not something you see a lot of these days. Same thing for typewriter repair. So we're we're updating all of the use terms in our zoning generally. So they reflect modern economies. And for production in particular, we're tying these uses to a system of industry classification that the federal government uses. It's called NAICS. It's uh, the North, North American Industry Classification System, updated every five years. And it's very precise and very specific on what kinds of businesses are, are allowed and, and how they're defined and how they're classified. And so this gives us a tool. It gives the Department of Buildings a really easy to use tool, which they've told us is, is easy to use. And it gives you all and community boards and others, it, it makes it very clear on where businesses can be uh, and, and what kinds of things they can do, what kinds of activities they can do in, in that space. And so the same changes we're applying to commercial areas, we're applying to our M1 to M3 zoning designations. But I also want to touch on the future of, of M zones, and that's proposal 18, where we've, it, through more than a year now, and, and really uh, going back to uh, even 2016, 2017, 
speaking with folks who do industrial service provide provision. And, and it's just really hard to build new industrial space in the city today, in part because our our zoning tools for M areas are just so antiquated with things like uh, sky exposure plane that makes it hard to build uh, up to a certain height or just very large yard requirements. And the, the ZR was constructed uh, thinking that manufacturing, which would be the predominant use of these districts, wasn't then, isn't today, but the it would be made by people who would drive and then go back, drive back to their jobs. And that wasn't the nature of mass production that we saw even in the city then, but it reflected the mindset of folks who created these tools in the future. So we're creating a new set of tools, ones that are, are useful in a variety of different contexts, but uh, have a more loft-like envelope so that you can build a new building for today's production and today's manufacturers, but one that doesn't rely on such uh, more low-lying sort of usually one story for, for, for your M11 uh, zoning designations. None of these new tools would be mapped as a part of this. So uh, if, if tools were deemed to be appropriate, they could be mapped through a future rezoning, but we would not, through this proposal itself, change the underlying zoning of any M district. I hope that answers your question. Oh, it does. And I just went, um, I, I think it's a little premature for us to debate each one of these individually. But as uh, committee members begin to look through uh, the, the draft, um, I hope he, I, I would like you to try to keep in mind two things, two primary things. One, in terms of how we redesign production and manufacturing, we are spending a trillion dollars over the next 10 years, by most estimates, on reshoring. Without the, these changes, we aren't going to see any of that because we, we don't have the zoning to be able to reshore anything based on the way the economy is moving right now and based on the econ economics of what things are uh, financially viable for us to reshore. So this is an attempt to address that. Number two is look at, when you look at the totality of all the different um, amendments, look at it in terms of supply because we have a supply issue. Repurposing of, of, of Spaces that aren't online, one way to address supply, the redevelop, uh, redevelopment and allowing uh, development that allows for mixed use is another way to address supply, just on the commercial side. And then this is also, and, and maybe it's not a good idea, but this is the, the intention of the NYCHA Tower and the Park proposal which, by the way, from a planning standpoint, has been proven to be pretty bad. This might be able to address that, okay, and address the supply issues. So these are the things, is think in terms of supply and, and in terms of how our, our, our city will be able to be more self-sufficient e from an economic standpoint in instead of just exporting uh, legal services, which are our number one export. And at Chuck's price, that's a pretty good deal for us. <laughs> but that's what we export, our legal services and financial services. Okay? And it's been good for us. But it, what, what, if it, what if that changes? So th this is an attempt to diversify and create a more sustainable, self-sufficient economy within New York City. Any more questions? For clarification, as it pertains to uh, my family, um, in the uh, M1 um, district, uh, there's the auto repair shops. Um, item that was on the screen said they have to disallow them to be on sidewalks and streets. If you know what a shop does, they are literally on the sidewalk and the street. 
where in the um, manufacturing areas do you think that they're going to be? And basically, I, the way I see it, it's only uh, possible if everything goes to major um, agencies, car agencies, and that they, and with the electric car, maybe that's the way it's going to go. The little guy is going to get shot like they did when the big stores started to open up. So the little grocery stores had to close. And this is going to happen with them. That's their financial burden, and I don't see that there's anything being done about that. If I'm not Thank you for... Uh, it's, yeah. it's commercial Th eight, right? Not M1. Right. So I want to want to make sure that I clarify the proposal there, which is number 13. So what we're saying here is if you're zoned as C8 or if you're zoned as M, that heavy vehicle repair, that's that's part of what it means to be in an industrial area. We think that makes sense uh, and in those locations. Continue doing as you were before. What we're saying in this proposal is that if you are operating on a retail street, so this is our C1 and C2 overlays, as well as our C4 district in, in CB8, in those districts, if you're an existing business, continue operating as before. If you want a new business to locate, you just have to go to the BSA in order to do a site plan review before you can locate. And this is to, within a retail context where there's a lot of pedestrians, just make sure that that activity isn't conflicting with people walking past, with having cars that are, are parked into the street and it's hard for drivers to get past. So it's trying to address some of those concerns when the, the context of the surrounding area is not primarily industrial, but rather it's a, a mix of residential and, and retail uses. Hi, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I do have a question. Um, maybe it's once again in the the six hundred page document. Uh, of course, I I'm assuming this is for the better of communities and what have you. My one of my concerns was already addressed, but another concern I have is um, how will some of this be enforced? I guess that would be under another committee. But I'm reading like num the goal number three, where it says the vibrant um, neighborhoods by ensuring businesses contribute to active, safe, and walkable streets, that sort of thing, and just any of these, how will this be enforced? Yeah, in buildings. That also within the document? Like, okay, no. if this happens. No. Yeah, so for, for the most part, uh, zoning is, is both interpreted and enforced by the Department of Buildings. Of course, Zoning is only one of many, many regulatory tools we have in the city. So places where other agencies come into play uh, oftentimes are, are outside of zoning, but are complementary to it. So when it comes to going back to Proposal 13 on auto repair, uh, the way we're defining where you are, the kind of auto repair that's allowed in commercial areas is based on whether you actually get a license from the state motor department of motor vehicles and if you do obtain a license uh, to do heavy vehicle repair, then you are not appropriate for, for retail streets. And of course, you're more appropriate for, for uh, industrial areas. So that's an example of it is, not the, it is not us. It's also not DOB that makes the determination whether you are the kind of auto repair business that is heavy industrial. It's the state. So these are places where other, other agencies and other regulatory uh, apparatus come into play. I mean, that was just an example, but I'm, I'm even thinking about, like, let's say someone does have a cannabis shop in their home. Um, yeah, like a home business, cannabis, cannabis home and business. Clean, small. Um, how... I'm wondering about how those things, not just the the, the um, auto repair, but how will things, of course, and how long will that take? Like, I'm saying this, I'm trying to choose my words wisely, but we have some businesses that are established now that aren't really um, legal. 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 Yeah. <laughs> I don't see anything.
anything necessarily. Well, I don't know. Maybe it is happening, but I still see the shop. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So zoning, zoning, and uh, the buildings department are also both not uh, usually able to enforce a legal activity that that falls under the jurisdiction of of agencies like NYPD. In some cases, in some cases, it's the mayor's office of special enforcement as it relates to um, to adult entertainment, for example. Um, but where where illegal activities are occurring, it's sort of outside of the realm of zoning entirely. Uh, and so that's where we rely on on working with other agencies in order to um, address that illegal activity. These home businesses, what legitimizes them to be business? Do they have to apply for like an LLC for taxes? And I'm just concerned because I've known several people who have like hair salons in their mm -hmm. home. They might yeah. braid here, they might do whatever, and how is this a legit business going through the state taxes, everything? Do they have to apply for an LLC or they can just open a business and get regulated in general? Like how? How is that happening? Fast and quiet. Yeah. If, if people, if, I, I might be able to at least partly address that. If people go through the process as they should because as you know if you're a, uh, if you run a salon you have to have a license that's issued by the state so unlicensed ones can be reported i don't know if it's the department of consumer affairs or worker protection i know when we have illegal tobacco businesses illegal street vending right now it's department of consumer affairs and if if there's a, a disturbance in the community from an unlicensed business then let us know and we'll we'll find the right people to report it as a as a business owner, I recommend every business owner get an LLC, and it's 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 a little time consuming, but it's definitely worth it because somebody comes to your home, and even if it's it's legal under the new uh, code, and they trip and fall in your apartment, or your dog bites them, or whatever, <coughs> then you know you're liable. But under with the limited liability company, then your company is liable, and it protects to a That's certain not extent. That's the LLC law. <laughs> yeah, because I could see them. Uh, it it could give you second tier liability. The apartment's up for grabs. But I would imagine that that uh, very dangerous in a residential yeah. uh, building because they very often catch on fire. Very large uh, problem. I'd like to see that happen. There was a spa just down the hall in this building. The landlord evicted them because. They would use certain acetones and certain things, uh, and the stench, we had to go home. The staff, everybody, said, and uh, we complained to the landlord, and actually the landlord here evicted um, that exhibit, business. Exhibit, they had a fire down in the basement, which was conducting a business. Mm -hmm. Not a legal business, but a business. Mm -hmm. The it's problem with it is mm -hmm. the enforcement agencies are divided and undermanned. What you need to have is a unified code enforcement system as Philadelphia and other cities have. The city has resisted that because the various agencies want to keep their own private inspectors. Do you have any more questions? Well, you could stop sharing your screen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. No, I have a well done, Matt. just to follow up. Sorry. Thank you all. Um, I just have a question on next steps for the board. Um, understandably, and we, Matt and I totally understand it is a lot of information. Um, it's a lot of text amendment coming at you like back to back. Um, so I'm hopeful that we can provide you with any other additional materials that are helpful for you to like make your decision like matt said we are expecting and we're hoping that you also um give us a detail of a response for each of the proposals as possible um so i'm just curious as to what's your next step as a committees and also as a board for for um waiting this in well, uh, and providing a proposal we could send the, the um comments before all this like just as soon as they're ready they could send their comments in on that um, like, checkbox or something that I think I saw. Yeah, that's for I believe that's just as a board. Yeah. Um, Matt. Yeah, yeah it's as well, a board. 
what we'd recommend in sort of the way we've been describing the worksheet is it's an appendix to when when you all would would vote as a, an overall board uh, towards the end of the 60 day process or when you whenever you hold that vote, you'll typically and many boards do at least have a, a cover letter describing the nature of the vote, whether where you approve what your conditions are. Think of this as kind of the the appendix or the additional information, see more info on the on what you want to say. So you'll vote yes or no, or with conditions on the overall package. And then this is the, the document that's meant to accompany that. Now, if you have questions before you get to that stage, that's what Camilla and I and my colleagues at, at the department are here for. So please over email or, or, or call or whatever is a typical means, communicate any questions you have uh, and then compile that feedback for us towards the uh, when when you're ready with it. I I didn't hear any feedback to Chuck's inquiry about delaying the certification of this. If you can do that, Nick, any... what I would urge uh, Barrett to do is to mm -hmm. send to every board member yes, all of the relevant citation materials. Tell them that at if you agree to hold it till the beginning of December, then we would schedule hearings within the board based on when they've had an opportunity to read it. So, for example, let's say you did it as of January 1, went through February, we would have the first hearing in December, certainly with economic development, then have one each month and get bits and pieces done my guess is we're better off taking them in crunches of six or so and getting it done that way. You're saying this is due in 60 days from when we get it formally sent to us, which will be this week. It'll be delayed. Uh, right. So um, as of now, um, I believe a deadline for the boards would be around um, January 10th. Um, but it's still tentative. Um, we would preferably have you submit your recommendations two weeks before the vote. As of right now, I don't, I do not have like a date, a final date that the vote will happen. Um, but I can tell you tentatively would be a deadline for you as a board to submit, um, January 10th. Um, so you are free to meet, um, as many times as you would like, um, and to talk among yourselves, of course, about the proposals, um, you won't get, you won't get, a, I tell you, realistically, the likelihood that you will get a thorough examination by maybe one or two people uh, is somewhere between a remote and never happened. It just doesn't allow enough time. Even those of us who watched it. You know, it was coming around this way. Chuck, is this the entire thing or just for the echo devs? Just the economics. Just yeah. the economics. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then you're going to have the other one. I know, yeah. the housing. We're already missed the other one. Yeah. I know. This is the one we didn't vote on. Right. Camille, you're going to send me, I, I appreciate if you resend me the targeted links, like you said, the link with the whole text language, the the worksheet and any other link you think that we can should have that everyone can review as soon as possible. Um, I do know a lot of community boards have asked to sign on to a request to, it's not just us, it's uh, many community boards throughout the city have signed on to say that they're asking for an extension. So. I hope when you do get that, we'll get a response on that. Board meeting is the sure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we can send um, the text again, um, and I can forward this presentation that I gave today as well. Um, and we totally hear your concerns about not having enough time um, and liking more time. Um, Farah, I think it was helpful as well for um, carbon neutrality. <clears throat> Um, when you compile all the questions that the board had and like board other residents had um, and sent it via email to me so that I could have like keep track of them and just send like one document with all the questions that the board had. That was pretty helpful. So I think if you could, if you would like to do that again, um, I would recommend it. Um, and I will send the text and this presentation that I gave today for the board for 
additional um, materials for your review. Could I make a suggestion to you, which is not covered in this presentation? One of the issues that has been around for many, many years is the requirement respecting the position of hotels and either residences or commercial space that are above or below them. If I recall correctly, the hotel has to be on the bottom and Residences have to be above it, as I recall. That was the subject of significant deterrence of commercial hotels to come into New York City so that you would have a more fluid situation of more residences and the like, because outside of New York City, frequently you will have an office facility above a hotel small hotels in areas that do it. It'll get rid of many of the B&B issues that you have. You might want to take someday a look at that hotel situation uh, and see if that makes sense to you. I think you will find that it, it has an economic impact. So, for example, one of the problem hotels frequently because it's used for, as a shelter facility is the hotel on 72nd Street with a French sounding name on 6th Avenue or Columbus Avenue or one of those? Yeah. One of the problems they have in that is they can't get an occupancy rate approaching 70%. Yet if they were able to have a facility in addition to that, which was either office or residential, it would work. You may not agree, but you have a point. No, thank you. Um, I think, Matt, if uh, a housing opportunity is not taking a look at hotels, um, but we can make a note of your comment for sure. Yeah. I, I wanted to uh, note two things and, and say one thing that the proposal is not doing uh, and one thing that the proposal is looking at. And so the the exact example you cite of a hotel and being able to have a hotel and other uses above that hotel, um, the proposal in economic opportunity is not looking that in, at that in part because we have a special permit requirement for any new hotels to be built in New York City. Um, but something the proposal is doing is taking a look at where you might want to have commercial uses and then have residential uses above in this admittedly pretty much always in Manhattan where you would see this but proposal number five looks takes a look at what we call stacking rules in our zoning where in the future um, we see this in many special districts today where you can have commercial and residential on the same floor provided there's physical separation between them or you could have commercial above residential again provided sufficient separation between them so separate entrances separate elevators uh, and, and sound mitigation in between the uses. So we think it makes sense to be able to adapt mixed use buildings in contexts like that. And so the proposal is allowing for that sort of, of mixed use construction or renovation to occur. So it's the spirit of what you're, you're describing, uh, albeit with different uses. In terms of the, um, I'm sorry, Ms. Farrah, may I? Please do. Just in terms of the, it, it, stop me if this doesn't make sense, but it seems to me the majority of objections they, that everyone had to this centers around three or four of these amendments. It makes sense to just hone in on those. For example, the home-based businesses seems to, that, that some people have some quite significant concerns about them. So, but some of these, obviously, the loading docks, I think we're pretty much in agreement. So we don't have to say things on loading. But let's look at the ones that we have issues with. The home-based business is one. The uh, nightlife is another. Uh, are there any others that I missed? So those seem to be the two primary concerns that that people have. I mean, which are just for I us to focus. Yeah, yeah, just for us to focus as we go forward. We just all focus and send. Right. Yeah. What we think of the problems, all right? Yeah. Has a I think the devil is always in detail. Having heard something 
doesn't mean I agree or disagree with it. I'd like to read it first before I make a judgment that these five bother me or these 20 don't. When, we, when you can, you'll send us the presentation. That's a good starting point. Yes, I will. But you can take a look at our website tonight, if you wish, uh, nyc.gov slash yes, economic opportunity, where we have uh, a bunch of resources, including more detailed presentations on each of the 18 proposals. That, that oh, there's a lot on there. Yeah. So you have to pick and choose. No, but that link, I'll, the general I'll, link. I'll give you the general link. Yeah, yeah, yeah the general link. Very easy to find. Okay, is there, if there's no more Hold questions. On. Any more questions for um, Camilla and you Matt from BCC? Okay. We want to thank you so much for presenting tonight, yes, and definitely I definitely thank you. Appreciate um, you know you're always responsive whenever we have questions, and I do appreciate if you could send us those materials, those links as soon as possible, and I will also send the general link for the site. Well, thank you again. Thank you all. Take care. So I guess I'll continue moderating. <laughs> the next item on the agenda is a report by um, Marty on uh, the SAG working group on the construction on Riverdale Avenue. We Did I skip number five? That is number five. You have the old agenda. I guess so. We moved that one to December. Uh, we met in early October. We planned to meet in late November. Uh, things are moving forward, but there are a couple of things that came up that I didn't report previously, and that is in our last discussion. SAG um, is now talking about, now that most of the stuff has been cleared up, and the only outside thing they're working on is the, the elevator and the problems with candidates and motors and so on. So once the elevators are completed, they'll be pretty much finished outside. So they're now talking about how to beautify the outside area, what kind of greenery they're putting in. It was part of the plan, but now it's it's more exact. And it was mentioned by Jay, they're even looking into the, uh, the possibility of putting a sculpture right in front of the building. Um, not the, uh, the, the aesthetic <laughs> police, but uh, I suggested uh, that perhaps if they're looking for a sculpture, they might look for a local uh, artist and use somebody from the area to for, to do it. And David uh, provided he was still here. There he is. Yep. And David provided them with a name. Actually, that's him right there, right above your head. Uh, but no, no, they're right behind you. Behind me. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I no, I was referring to the painting, but Daniel's a good starting point. Points well taken, Bob. So that's as I say, they're looking toward um, beautifying the outside. Uh, now that they can start focusing on that, and the only other thing, <clears throat> which I think will be the primary uh, uh, direction for our meeting at the end of the month is what happens when they're finished. So the concern of AMI, concern of how uh, advertising will be done, uh, lotteries, whatever system they're going to be using to be able to fill those apartments, we'd like to learn more. The last time I touched it with Jay, uh, Jay made a point that he is totally in construction and doesn't deal with that. But I'll give him a heads up that we'll be looking uh, to that kind of information and hopefully he'll bring some. Only thing beyond that is we're still concerned. I don't know if Chuck has more information, because at the moment our conversation with Jay is things are in the works and nothing's happened yet with respect to Waldo. And um, we have more information. I have nothing to report. Is it too wide? All right, if there's... There's no questions on that. Um, we come out on to our outstanding business. So we'll start with economic development. Uh, do we have any outstanding business? Or new business. New business? <laughs> outstanding business? Uh, no, I can give a, a, a very just 
quick overview of what we've done and what we're doing. At that. So we had our commercial corridor walkthrough on Friday, November 3rd. I want to thank Farah for helping, and Rashida, for helping put everything together with uh, the, the Business Express Service Team and uh, Bronx District Attorney's Office. We did over 30 businesses, shared lots of resources with them, and got some really good feedback. So our next meeting will be pending what we do with land use and what uh, what Chuck and I decide to do in terms of discussing this uh, text amendments going forward. Our next meeting should be uh, December 5th at Artisan on Riverdale Avenue. Do you have business meeting agenda items? An economic matter. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, we have a meeting coming up uh, with a fair number again of uh, zoning applications. Where that all goes. Where are we with Hebrew Home? Oh, the Hebrew Home thing is, is really tough. We approved on or disapproved. The application of the Hebrew home to build that separate area where they would have these long-term deals up for the elderly, where you buy it while you're young, and you grow into it. Sort of. uh, into it. <laughs> it then went to the borough president. The borough president put through a series of amendments that the right to do to make some of the points that we had made here, but in any event. That then went to the council. It was approved. All this is is a permit application. The permit is only good for five years. They haven't built all the buildings yet, and they are seeking a, a new permit. Um, I thought it was because of the heat it generated last time. It's only fair that people be given an opportunity to comment if there's something new and different uh, that needs to be addressed. It isn't the original premise that something in its application calls for additional hearings. So we, they asked to have it put over because they are meeting with city planning over various aspects of the permit. It makes no sense to have it done now, tonight, when they haven't yet gotten an agreement with what the hell they're doing. They haven't done anything. Before. They haven't had any. No, but they've done some of the peripheral uh, yeah. work to get ready. But they've got they've got a bunch of issues. This is the very first of those kind of facilities in the city of New York, and the firsts always go through a hell of a lot of, uh, of look see. We have another series of problems. You know about the mudslide that caused a problem up on the Metro North. This area around the Hebrew home and the area around uh, yeah. one lower down are really serious potentials for mudslides. There have been mudslides. Yeah. Yeah. That little building in the park, you, know, you go down there on the station, you know the building at the end? Mm -hmm. It was once covered by mud. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, that's a very serious issue because there's a serious contest as to who's responsible. Um, with respect, uh, it is not as responsive as it could or should be. Amen. Um, <laughs> it, it, are you finished with the with the uh, Hebrew home? Oh, can I, I come? I'm finished with that. Comment on Hebrew home. Uh, Bob's gonna go first, Jody. Then I'll, we'll call on you. You you know Chuck when we're going to be getting the third component of the city of yes the housing component? No idea. They acted like later this year, next year. Spring. Well, I would imagine it's next yeah. year. I mean, we're already in November. Yeah. It's their pleasure. <laughs> okay. That's the one that will cause all sorts of mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's that's going to ignite uh, we some it. activity. Not, not exaggerate. On occasion, I'm given to exaggeration. I was not exaggerating when I said there is a deliberate plan on the part of the city of New York to take all of the housing authority projects in the city of New York and make them privatized. 
-hmm. and they've done it so far this way. They've let out a single RFP, the same way that uh, the people, the Health and Human Services or whoever is the homeless shelter people, one generic RFP, and people apply to become the manager. The manager is given a proprietary interest for a term of years, lease out however they want to, which is the beginning of the end of economic controls for the people who live in those, and to develop it. Um, I will tell you, I put on a, one of my rare, very rare performances. You ain't going to get this one passed. I'll go public. Uh, but I will tell you that they have, when, when it comes to the Bronx, I wouldn't let it happen. But I will tell you, in Brooklyn, they put four of them through. They tried one here for the Eden Houses. No way, no how. In City of, I'm sorry, in City of Yes, housing, they have, they call it infill. It's mm -hmm. the, right, and they said uh, uh, NYCHA, um, Mitchell Lama, uh, urban renewal, all kinds of federal, state, city, to put up, if there's buildings there, you could put up more buildings. Mm -hmm. Most of you are familiar with the housing down at Marble Hill. Housing at Marble Hill has, has originally contemplated when the Housing Authority projects were erected, specific areas where there are benches, where there people can sit, where there's grass, Buzz grass, uh, where, where the people can play and the like. That's exactly where they want to put extra buildings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the issue, I said to them, could you put in there additional housing authority buildings? It would be brand new and subject to occupancy by people in the oldest building there so that you could move people from an older building to a newer building and then tear down the older building or do something else. No, no, no. These are additional buildings to generate income. To generate income, are these going to be regulated by the same standards as the housing authority? Oh, no. no. These are privately private. operated private. buildings. Yeah. And that's why this is, it's a ripoff. It's an absolute ripoff. I, I don't want to get into this debate this evening because I think it's very late. Mm -hmm. But I just, you know, we have to keep in mind that there's a reason why we're moving towards privatization because the current model is unsustainable. So if, if, they're, if not privatizing, then, then and, 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 and by the way, when you, if, if you have to choose between the private sector and the public sector to run something, I don't I have to tell you that. where I fall on. I agree okay. with that. But let's not, let's well, not let get into the... Let me make a point to you. Unsustainable financially. That presupposes that it is intended to be something that breaks even. It is something that's supposed to be making money. It is not. It was conceived from day one that the Housing Authority project would be for people who couldn't afford regular housing mm -hmm. and that government had a responsibility to provide them shelter. That is a presumption. They weren't intended to be sustainable. Mitchell Lama was very different. Mitchell Lama was intended to be a little bit more than break even. But those, that, those were serious concepts. Now, if the public policy is to walk away from that. You're wrong about how NYCHA first came to be. It was supposed to be for people coming out of the war and for working class people. Right. The only time it became for the very low income and no income was when um, HUD instituted Section 8. Correct. Then that's how the bigger Correct. blocks started to get built and Correct. how the city and the state and the federal government started subsidizing the housing and how the population in decades changed to mostly no income. And the problem with that was they built all these mega buildings they put no social services in it. And if you had a three-bedroom apartment that you rented at a time when you had two or three or four kids or whatever, and they all moved out and you're just you alone, it. 
you still have the whole point. I mean, there are a whole range of issues there. Right. But the point is, now what is being done, no ifs, no buts, no maybes, and when, when you talk to them off the record, they will acknowledge. We want to get rid of this. It's a problem for us, so let's privatize it. But they're right? doing it at Fulton House in Manhattan. Yes. Tenants were told that they're going to renovate the, the building, to actually literally tear it down, and you have an opportunity to move back. No one believes them. They're going to. Well, but that, that's not that's not part of the economic development agenda tonight. Correct. Correct. So let's show <laughs> yeah. Can I defer my question on housing until yeah. until yeah. we so come to the that? housing discussion? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. Well, Ju no, someone had a second. Jody, Jody had a second. Oh, she yeah, got tired of it. that motion. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Have a good night.